Son tole kasam ye 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 Chili nan pete senye sam ye 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 Sakini le son tova gwa san ye 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 Chili le apela ne sam spe ye 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 I've worked in every medium of film there is to work in. Documentary, feature film, commercials, promos, ads, the lot. And I've been lucky enough to be one of the few people to have won every award there is to win, <laughs> right? In this country, right? But having said all of that, it's up until I dropped this music video that you see behind me that everything changed for me. It was this time last year that it happened. And since then, a parking attendant would be pulling me over. Oza, oza, oza. As soon as I park and he sees me, he goes, Spirit! Right? <laughs> or a waitress at a restaurant, when they bring the bill, they're like, oh my God, Spirit! Right? And I've been wondering, what is it about this music video that moves people so much? And to be quite honest, I can never explain it. All I know is that we went to Katlehong, which is in the east of Joburg. We found Katlehong people. Every single person that you see in this music video as it's playing is a real person. Nobody's cast, nobody came from an agency, nobody's acting out the moment. It was real people from the street. The interesting thing is, when you got there 3.30 in the morning, for instance, and you saw one of the images with the pastor about to baptize somebody in the water, the cameras were ready and everybody's ready, we were ready to go. It was a long 23 hour day. And then as we were about to shoot, the pastor went, hold up, hold up, hold up. Just give me a few seconds to pray, would you? And half of my crew, which was atheist, was a bit confused. <laughs> but we let it happen. And he prayed and then he baptized somebody. And then we went to the other house and then there was another pastor who was there. And we wanted to shoot him immediately. And he said, wait, wait, wait. Do you mind to shoot me praying for the crew? And we did a, a Zangoma as well. And then as we were about to shoot this Zangoma, the Zangoma said, wait, let me go burn some mpep. If you don't know what that is, that's incense, right? And, and that for me was an intriguing thing because every moment, or if you may, every spiritual moment that you see in this music video actually happens. It wasn't planned, it wasn't blocked out, it wasn't fabricated, it was real, actual people. I do think that's where the secret of the music video is. It is in finding real people and then showing them in a light that they've never seen themselves in. A lot of people, they say, man, you know that pastor down the street, man, I see that. They go, this brass band, I always see it, but there's a way that you framed it that you make it feel so glorious and feel like we're human again. And I think that's the beautiful thing about it. I think a lot of times our people have not been framed, nor shot, nor dealt, and their image and their name treated with such dignity that they've seen in this music video. And for that is uplifting and for that is powerful. My firm belief is that good storytelling can change and redefine a name in the people that are watching it. I believe Katlehong used to be known in the late 90s as this place, sort of this melting pot of post-94 IFP and ANC fights. A lot of battles went down, a lot of people died. But I think since this music video came out, people don't remember Katlehong as that violent town. They remember it as that town where spirit was shot. So in telling and being dignified to our people and telling the necessary stories, you can completely flip how people see or define somebody's name and reputation. Ah, yeah. uh, let me take you back a little bit. <laughs> so, I'm a son of a preacher. <laughs> so you can kind of imagine what's happening in my head. <laughs> I'm one of four boys. That's me too. You're right, my left. And talking about names, I think there's a lot of story in a name. And 
my parents were a little bit creative when it came to naming us. When it came to naming us. My oldest brother, who is to the far right, his name was Onassis. <laughs> named after Aristotle Onassis, who is one of the most famous, richest men in the world, right? Go figure. Baby man naming a, a kid Onassis. And then next is my two twin brothers, right? First, it's lament. Yes, as in weep, cry, in deep agony. <laughs> it's quite bleak, isn't it? But wait, there's comfort. <laughs> Who is my other brother? Right? And then the last born, which is me, the apple of their eye, the crown jewel of the family. <laughs> Who do they name me? They name me Devs. <laughs> My name is so popular that I can guarantee you there's probably another Devs in the room. The unfortunate thing about having a name like this, especially back then in the township, was that the most famous Devs was a gangster. He was Devs Mambul. He was a guy that used to steal cars. He was a guy that used to hijack. He was a bad guy. So I'm a son of a preacher who's inherited this name, a gangster name. So what do I do? So the onus is on me to go, I need to intentionally tell a different narrative so that the other devs that come after me get remembered for, oh, that cool devs are that cool creative, as opposed to, ah, oh, devs are the gangster. And I think there's power in the type of story that we tell to transform how people receive a name. And I guess that's the premise of my talk today. Now, in keeping with the heritage of my family, I'm a two month old dad. And, and, and my son so happens to be in the room. I'm sure he's the youngest attendee of TEDx <laughs> ever. <laughs> so I thought, man, let's carry on this heritage and let's give him a name. So that's my son's name. <laughs> so that's him, yeah. He's cool. So his name is Caleb Wolisan Shinji Malope. There you go, son. Take it, run. Go tell your own story. <laughs> Now, I want to tell two specific stories about my life and my experiences and how the power of trying to tell an authentic story and a real story and showing an alternative life can transform how people see somebody or how people receive somebody. This is Muse, not news. Muse is a Somalian teenage pirate. Muse was famous for being arrested after hijacking a ship. He so happened to hijack an American ship. Bad move. <laughs> they grabbed him, they arrested him, they took him into a prison in New York. I get a phone call from a Canadian friend of mine. He says, man, I have a link that I wanna send you. We have to go tell this story. He sends me a link, it's a CNN link, and they're talking about him. That's him, in the middle. At this point, he was 15 years old, right? And he's surrounded by these cops and soldiers and these officials, and they're essentially dragging him. And there's all this media snapping away. I mean, it's crazy. And this guy chained to his ankles and to his wrists, and he's just walking so gradually. I watched that thing a couple of times, but there's a moment that I kept stopping on and rewinding, stopping on rewinding, stopping on rewinding, and this was that moment. I'm, <laughs> I'm, why is he smiling? <laughs> and we went on to title this documentary that we tried to make, The Smiling Pirate. Because we thought there's something else, there's an alternative narrative to this kid that people don't know, but they've already concluded his narrative that he's a bad guy, arrest him, lock him up. <laughs> and then me and my friend Keza, we decided we're going to Somalia, I packed my bags, camera, sound, we flew all the way to Nairobi to have a quick meeting, and then we skipped over to a little region of Somalia called Puntland. He lived in a little village called Galkayo. And we hopped over because I couldn't get a South African visa for Somalia. Because <laughs> at the time they were not letting us do it. But we were so determined and so passionate about telling his other narrative that it pushed us to the edge. Needless to say, we landed, we got arrested, 
This picture was taken, they took all my bags, all my equipment, but I had a small little smartphone with a camera inside my pocket. So we were literally sitting at the back of the van and I was secretly taking these pictures. This one on the right is a picture that I took literally about three minutes after we got captured. When they looked at my passport, they all went, Mandela! <laughs> I thought, we're going to live. <laughs> Thank you, Dad. <laughs> but then they looked at my friend's passport and it said Canada. I go, I go. <laughs> and that's when it all turned. So they took this and it was the longest week of my life. I'm going to fast forward to what happens afterwards. Then I get back, I'm traumatized. All I was trying to do was to tell another story of Muslim. I'm so traumatized, all I do is I take my laptop and I try to sort of try and encapsulate what just happened to me. I write page after page after page of story and people keep asking me, what happened to you guys? And all I can do is I have no words for it. I keep forwarding and sending this little blog that I wrote about my experience. This blog then later happened to land on the, t on the table of a TV creator for SABC, the South African Broadcasting Corporation. And then this person doesn't freak out at the trauma of my experience. They go, man, you can write a story. <laughs> Do you want to come and co-write and let's create a TV show? And then that went on to become the TV show that I won my first SAFTA Award, South African Film and TV Award. Now, the aim was not to go win the award. The aim was to tell a different story about an individual and to only be driven purely by passion and by love. Second story. Oh, before I go to the second story. Muse, you might have known, the story I was just telling you now. Hollywood bid me to it. A few years later, three or four years later, they went and made a feature film called Captain Phillips. The guy on the left, he played Muse. But unfortunately, I think right now he's like 33 years old. So it wasn't really like an accurate depiction of Musa because at the time he was 15 years old. And I yearn and I wish they can make Captain Phillips too. Because there's another side of Musa that nobody actually knows about. And that he graduated last week inside a prison in New York. Let's talk quickly about the pavement book one. <laughs> I'm driving down Empire Road. Empire Road is a street in Johannesburg. I come from a very depressing pitch. I'm not happy about life and myself. I see in the middle of the street what looks like a homeless guy. But what's intriguing about him is he's got stacks of books next to him. So I pop to the side, I walk across the street, I go, man, what is your story? And before he even tells me anything, he starts rambling off about these books. He goes, do you know Dan Brown? I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and then he starts rattling it off. And I go, what is your story? He says, this is what I do. When people come, I don't beg for money. I give you a quick 30 second review of a book. You like it, I sell it to you. You give me your money, you go home and you go read. I'm like, whoa, stop there. I've got a camera in my car. Do you mind if I film this? And then he graciously led me. So I go into the car, I grab my camera, and this is what I shoot. John Christian, I like him because he's a lawyer. Well, he's a lawyer, this guy, and he writes only about crime, more especially in courts, like some sort of mysteries that is that kind of author. That's why I focus on giving away free peace only kids' books, so that they can take these books and give to kids. You remember back in the 18th centuries, 19th centuries, ladies were like, and men were the remote respected people. So this lady earned a lot of respect from everybody all around the world. So that's why his brother wanted to say, he, he wrote, most parts of this book, whether in hand, kids, because they can still take this reading thing and turn it into their habits, a long life habit. Because 
every habit you learn, you gain from here. Like smoking, you were born, you were not smoking, but now some people smoke. Why? Because you got it from here. This Nora Robert. Ah. So. <laughs> So I went later on, a few minutes later, posted this clip on YouTube. Immediately it went viral around the world. I started getting sort of emails and text messages from Europe, from the US, from South America. Locally, every radio station was on it. Every newspaper was on it. A Couple of days later, people were coming. People offered him a scholarship to go finish his high school. People were so inspired by his story. A couple of weeks later, he's on TV. <laughs> then Pilani is huge, right? But when I put his name on YouTube, I was like, what, how, how do I rename him? How do I sort of create a different narrative about this guy? And so on my YouTube description, I put the pavement bookworm. And then he released his first book, and they called it the pavement bookworm. <laughs> I like that they took that picture that I shot on my camera and they did an illustration for the cover. And today I know that he's releasing a second book next year and he's asking me to write the foreword for it. Now, now, what is the point that I'm making? The point that I'm making is we are driven by pure passion to tell an alternative story about somebody. You never know what could happen. Lives could be changed and we can redefine a whole institution, a whole person, a whole continent, a whole people by just dream, being driven by pure passion of telling an alternative narrative. And as you know, <laughs> Pilani beat me to the red dot. <laughs> so a few years ago, Pilani was on the same stage telling his story, which makes me really, really proud. In conclusion, I think once we have passion for our people, then we can tell stories that are full of integrity, that are full of sincerity. I feel like every bit of story that has sort of made an impact in my personal life and in my shift in my career has been a story that has been purely drawn from being driven by pure passion for our people. And I'm not talking about this fake passion because we're trying to sell them something. I'm talking about even though we do the hard work, the hard work of excelling in what we do, the hard work of being great business people, of being great leaders, I think we have to do as much hard work in our hearts to look closely and deeply in ourselves and say, do we really love our people? Because everything that we do, unless it is driven by pure passion that is overflowing and is unstoppable from our heart, everything that we'll do will come to none. So my life, I don't know what has happened and I don't know why people feel everything that I do resonates with them so much. The only thing that I know is there's a deep passion that's overflowing. And I think if we all live and guide our lives like that, we'll definitely tell a different story. And when we do that, we'll definitely change the narrative about our people, about South Africa, about Africa. Thank you.